Hey, for centuries before Mahmud of Ghazni, the Shahs of Kabul were one of the great powers of present-day Afghanistan. From the 7th to 10th century CE, they warred with Arabs and Afghans and allied with Kashmiris and Khotanis. The name Kabul Shahs might conjure up images of staunchly Islamic rulers, but in reality, they confound our binary expectations of the medieval world. Most Kabul Shahs were Buddhist or Hindu and descended from ethnic groups from present-day Pakistan and portions of Central Asia. They coexisted with elephant-riding Multani emirs and Sindhi Arabs who wore earrings inspired by Deccan, Shaivite and Jain kings. I am Anirudh Kanisetti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our citations and research below and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. In the 6th century CE, an earthquake devastated the region of Gandhara in present-day northwest Pakistan. Once the seat of the Hephthalites, Kushans, Indo-Parthians, and Indo-Greeks, it had been the gateway through which the peoples of Central Asia entered the subcontinent. It was also a major center of Buddhism and trade, frequented by pilgrims from as far away as China. Gandhara wasn't a frontier of the subcontinent though, in fact, it was this diverse region was integral to the development of the culture that we now think about as Indian. More in this video here. Networks of exchange adapted in response to the collapse of Gandhara. Flows of people and goods now moved through the cities of Kabul and Ghazni in Afghanistan, entering the subcontinent through the southern portions of the Hindu Kush mountains. Simultaneously, groups of Turkic language speakers conquered the region, adapting to its existing religious culture. Known today as the Turk Shahis or the Kabul Shahis, they worshipped both Buddhist and Hindu gods popular in the region. They ruled over cosmopolitan society and were responsible for commissioning remarkable works of art, such as this marble sculpture of the god Surya, depicted as a Turk wearing a long robe and boots. The Kabul Shahis and other local chiefs had a complex relationship with the growing power of the Abbasid Caliphate in neighboring Iran. On occasion, when sufficiently impressed with Abbasid power, these rulers might convert to Islam and adopt elements of Persian culture while still using Sanskrit in their coins. Local Buddhist or Hindu rulers were happy to arrange marriage alliances with local Muslim chiefs against mutual external threats, as noted by archaeologist Deborah Klimberg Salter in The Kingdom of Bamiyan. But identities and modes of worship were fluid. In her 2009 paper, Corridors of Communication Across Afghanistan, 7th to 10th centuries, Klimberg Salter notes that many cities in the period had communities that coexisted and shared practices, sacred sites, and pilgrimage networks. Historian Finbar Barry Flood provides an interesting example of the porosity of boundaries in objects of translation, mentioning a merchant who worshipped idols when in Afghanistan, which was then the frontier of the Islamic world, but reverted to visiting mosques when he returned to Iraq. Merchants like this man, moving between frontiers and identities, were crucial to the prosperity of the Kabul Shahis, whose kingdom grew to encompass parts of present-day Punjab, undertaking alliances with rulers in present-day Kashmir and Xinjiang. Fluid royal identities could be found throughout the frontier of South Asia and West Asia, in fact. Flood also discusses the cases of the Muslim emirs of Multan and Sindh who adopted elite cultural practices from Shaivites and Jains. The emir of Multan visited the congregational mosque of the town in a weekly elephant back procession, just like a Maharaja might. The emir of Sindh, who was a close trading partner of the Rashtrakota Empire of the Deccan, wore earrings and sported long hair like a South Asian royal. And yet, these men seem to have considered themselves very much Muslim. Medieval peoples just thought of religion, politics, and identity in very different ways than us, and of course they would. They lived over a thousand years ago, and a lot can change in a thousand years. By the 9th century CE, other Turkic groups from Central Asia, especially the Oghuz Turks, began to play a role in West Asia. 
they were the primary source for military slaves serving in the Abbasid Caliphate, but the Caliphate's authority in Iran still declined through the 10th century. It was replaced with aggressive Persian princedoms, such as those of the Safarids and Samanids, who used Turk mercenaries in their battles against each other and against local tribal chiefs who were often Buddhists. The wealth collected from such activities helped gradually consolidate a new Turco-Persian cultural complex in this frontier region. Mehmud of Ghazni, who lived a century later, was a product of that world. Around this time, the Turk Shahis were overthrown by a dynasty popularly called the Hindu Shahis and today imagined as Indians. In reality, according to historian Abdur Rahman in New Light on the Kingal, Turk and Hindu Shahis, they were probably a now vanished ethnic group called the Odis who were a Gandharan group native to present-day Pakistan. These Odi Shahis were one of the dominant powers of the Kabul region, participating actively in the geopolitics of the northwest frontier of the subcontinent. They battled and intermarried with local chiefs and kings, whether Hindu, Buddhist or Muslim. The famous Kashmiri queen Didda was of Odi Shahi descent. Some branches of her family were definitely married to Muslims, including an emir called Abu Ali Lawik, who was, according to the Encyclopedia of Islam, a brother-in-law of the Odishahi king and ruled Ghazni un until it was conquered by the predecessors of Mahmud of Ghazni. I don't know what to tell you. History is messy and complicated. Now I want to talk to you about the coins of the Odishahis, who were renowned for high silver content and marked with a horseman on one side and a recumbent Nandi bull on the other. They were of such high quality that they spread through much of eastern Eurasia. In the 9th century, the Safarid Amirate conquered Kabul from the Odishahis. After that, in typical medieval warlord fashion, they tried to legitimize themselves in two apparently contradictory ways. The first way was, of course, to send large quantities of looted idols to the Abbasid capital in Baghdad, but at the same time, they still issued Odishahi-style silver coinage with the minor addition of an Arabic word or two. So what's going on here? It's, it's not just a modern stereotype of quote-unquote Islamic iconoclasm, though maybe that's a part of it. The continued issuance of the coins shows us that medieval elites like today's were perfectly capable of acting one way to one audience and another way to another audience. It made political sense for them to send idols to Baghdad, so they did that. But it also made political sense to keep issuing Nandi coins locally, so they did that too. Elites didn't really care about imposing homogeneity, it seems. They just really wanted to get rich and powerful. Klimberg Salter, in her aforementioned paper, notes that there are no archaeological evidences of a rapid conversion to Islam in the aftermath of Kabul's conquest. Instead, the cosmopolitan city continued to be contested by the Shahis, Safarids, and Samanids, all of whom were multicultural local polities, until they were all wiped out by Mahmud of Ghazni in the 11th century. That world of Indianized Hindu and Buddhist Turks would not return as Afghanistan now became more firmly Turko Persian. Or did it? More in future episodes of Thinking Medieval. I get the narrative of Islamic invasions of a uniformly Hindu region, but I don't really think that model explains the historical evidence very well. I think the medieval world is defined by fluid, complex interactions between many cultural zones, all interacting and evolving with each other more soon. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at Akanisati. We'll see you next week.